gentle. It's, it's not governed by our context, by this present world. Um, our models are not from this world. It's from above. That's why Jerusalem is continuously descending. And, um, and we, we are descending. We are the Jerusalem that's descending and creating a pervasive presence in the earth. We are permeating all things. And the presence of God is being established through that. I would like, for a few minutes, very briefly, just finish my series of teaching. And I need to just touch on the subject of prayers so that my assignment for this school has been completed, as would have been all of our speakers. Um, And so, let's get back to Hebrews chapter 9. Remember the four pillars that I've been speaking on? Firstly, Apostles' Doctrine, the candlestick. Um, Fellowship, represented by the table. The, The showbread, or the bread of His presence. Um, represented by the distribution of grace our God appears in that context and then we have to go to this dimension called prayers prayers. and if you see here very clearly in verse 4 verse 3 says and behind the second veil the second veil there was a tabernacle which is called the holies of holies that's beyond the dimension called the holy place having a golden altar of incense so we know that in that dimension there is a golden altar of incense which is symbolic of the spirit of prayer that we would have to discuss uh, discuss, and you do know that no prayer can take place in the flesh it has to take place in the spirit and we have to learn how to pray in the holy spirit the mantic and ritualistic practices of how you could you could do certain things ritually that is uh, in the earth by walking seven times around the city wall uh, spiritual mapping all of that stuff while some of it may be initiated by God I think they have become religious um, acts and acts of works that do not govern how God establishes his purpose in the earth and we probably would have to in the future really revisit the whole culture of prayer because I personally think that a lot of our prayer um, is governed by the spirit of works and anything that is merited cannot be defined or classified as grace and anything that is produced through works um, does not please God I know that faith without works is dead but I'm talking about a culture of works where we think that my three hours of praying from four till seven in the morning or whatever uh, is the result of why my church is blessed uh, is, uh, is salvation by works and not by grace through faith in God and these things we need to and now I'm not attacking a personal devotion to the Lord and the necessity to find the quietest time of your day or night in which you would devote it in an undivided way to the Lord and where you could, could come to a place of engaging Him and allowing for that synergistic relationship to take place between you and your God there's no personal experience more, there's no more as personal experience for me and just resting in his presence and communing with him so I'm not attacking that I really believe that the culture of prayer as the apostles would model for us is a prayer of devotion totally to God but what we do see in the church presently um, is and it proceeds out of the spirit of institutionalized religion and uh, it's no different with, uh, than making your, your pilgrimage to Mecca or going on some holy visit to Jerusalem, the natural Jerusalem. No different. We need to come back to the original devotion that God's called us to in prayer. But I want to talk about that dimension today. The dimension of spiritual engagement beyond the veil. If you went, for example, to chapter 10. Chapter 10. First, where is it? Okay, verse 19 and 20. Since therefore, brethren, we have confidence to enter the holy place 
by the blood of Jesus and by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil that is his flesh and you know that when the veil was torn in two his, actually his flesh was torn in two so that he, should, he could show us the way beyond the flesh where spirit could speak to spirit and deep to deep and um, in that dimension we have to learn how to go into because a lot of what we do is still restrained by our flesh and there is a dimension that we have to look at go back to chapter 9 having a golden altar of incense verse 4 and the ark of the covenant so firstly there is a golden altar of incense um, and the ark of the covenant covered on all sides with gold in which was a golden jar holding the manna watch the ingredients the compositional makeup of the ark of the covenant a golden jar holding the manna one manna two Aaron's rod three the t- tables of the covenant the covenant and above it that's the fourth, that fourth place uh, fourth thing that we need to take note of, of above it the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat but of these things we cannot now speak in detail let's get to Luke 24 quickly again I really want to to lay something here and then um, and then challenge us this is the whole thing I want to talk about today Uh, what I want to lay before you in this session is a challenge to go beyond where you are that's all and um, hope that you will journey in God to places at his right hand and thank God he didn't say that he 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 had raised us up to be seated with him in a heavenly place but he has caused us to be seated with him in heavenly places um, it's, it's a reference to John chapter 14 when he said that uh, I go to prepare um, uh, a dwelling place for you but he was not talking about a dwelling place as in singular um, uh, he was talking about uh, that dimension of different placements beyond uh, the realm of this, this earthly existence um, in my father's house there are many mansions there are many places dwelling places that is the reference there and you have to see that John chapter 14 with the preceding chapter chapter 13 and you know that we've really challenged the, the doctrine of eschatology in, in, in the school and we, as we have done in previous schools it's come in different ways but we've challenged this whole idea that we go to heaven to get a mansion but we are now talking about the various places in the economy of God so there are movements that's why there are more than one, there is more than one heaven there are the heavens of heavens I've got a series on, on giving definition to the heavens I think we call it the open heavens and I would suggest that you go and listen to it, it it's, it's quite a complex series but um, you can get it you can ask the office to make a copy for you if, if it's not on our table but I want to talk about that dimension. Verse 35, 4, 34 and 35 um, of Luke 24. Let's read from verse 33. No, no, 32, 32. Okay, after their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight verse 32 says and they said to one another were not our hearts burning within us while you were speaking to us on the road can I just say something and this is as Sam will say on the side on the side one of the signs of true apostolic ministry the candlestick ministry the apostle that 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 propagates and prosecutes doctrine that expounds interprets translates and brings doctrine to you when it comes into your heart, it will either pierce your heart or cause a burning sensation in your spirit. 
That's one of the signs of true apostolic proclamation. Something happens. Sometimes you won't sleep. Sometimes your spirit is arrested for days. Even if you try to put your head on the pillow, certain things are reverberating within your spirit. There's a churning, there's a turning, there's a burning, there's a piercing, there's, there's weeping, there's a, there's a quietness, at times there's a restlessness. All of this is some of the signs of apostolic doctrine. You see this with Jesus, the kind of doctrine he preached, the astonishment, the awe, the wonder, the amazement, uh, the provocation, excuse me, the ability for people to sit through long hours and sometimes days listening to him. All of this is a sign of the burning heart. And this is, this is a grace that comes. It's not clever preaching. It's not that people went and got a PhD in English so they can hold you captive for a, for, for a period of time. This is, this is the miracle of, of, of such proclamation. And you need to understand this. And that's one, maybe it's one of the characteristic signs that you need to note in your spirit as to what is the candlestick ministry and who the angelos is um, that, that, that causes that candlestick to be lit so that your church can be illuminated and live in an environment of great enlightenment. Um, and they arose that very hour. Um, and the, uh, yeah, uh, uh, were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us on the road, while he was explaining the scriptures to us. And remember, much of what will happen in our lives in this season will happen in a relational context. And out of relationally uh, engaging the Lord on the road, on the way, the people of the way, the expositions and explanations of the Lord will take place. There are many occasions when I will be driving my motor vehicle, literally driving my motor vehicle and talking with the Lord, and suddenly a thought will explode in my spirit. It was like out of relationships came revelations or explanations of God. And I would sometimes be forced to... to, to, to uh, get to the nearest point where I could park my vehicle and write things down. I also found that even in airplanes I get some of my greatest messages. Maybe it's because I'm closer to heavenly places, I don't know. <laughs> or maybe because you pray more when you're in airplanes, especially when you hit turbulence. I don't know, but I find that God gives me a lot of messages um, in my journey with Him. In my journey with Him. And, um, and this point is being highlighted beautifully. But you note also that at the breaking of the bread, he was seen. Okay? He was seen. Uh, and then they say something very controversial, which I will try to get back. Uh, verse 33 says, And that very hour they returned to Jerusalem and found gathered together the eleven and those who were, were with them. So you see how they go back to the apostolic center. I, I, want, to, I want to highlight this this. this uh, centrifugal principle, this, this, this movement to the, the, the centrality um, um, uh, of authority, where from the center of authority, even if you are at the outward, which is, which, which is the centrifugal, the centri, what we will call in theological terms, the centripetal program, uh, uh, position, which is that when you are on the outward, on the perimeter, on the boundary uh, uh, of what you're engaging in, you, there's always a movement to the center, the seat of authority. There's always a movement. And when you are at the center, where the apostolic authority is, there's always a movement for, for, for the blood to, 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 to send itself or, or, or for the organ to send blood to every other, every other area, the, to the outward, to the boundary. So you'll see this movement to the center and then to the outward. To the center, the inward, then the outward. You know, it's the afferent and afferent positions uh, where these two dimensions, one goes, one goes from the center to the out and then from the outward to the center so that there's no, there's no centrality of government without having a group of people that you're always supplying. And that group of people are always coming to the center to receive the supply. You must, you must get that. Um, and then they say something very, very contradictory 
In fact, it can challenge uh, the authenticity of the Gospels. And they say, they come to the eleven and they say, the Lord has really risen and appeared to Simon. I mean, there's no reference to the Lord having appeared to Simon, but they acknowledge the set man principle here. That because he's the first amongst equals, that because he will be the first that will stand with the other eleven, because he is the representative type of the captain of the team, or the first amongst equals, they will come and say the Lord has appeared to him. But you know that if you go a few verses back, um, you will find that God never appeared to Simon. When he heard the woman saying the grave is empty, he ran and saw just the clothes. So there is something here that I can't even unpack right now, but I think we should take note of. There's something about acknowledging uh, the gate through which the Lord comes into a place and how that principle is always honored in the Scriptures. How the, uh, even Paul, when, when, he, when he first meets with the apostles, he, he, he meets not with all the apostles, but only with Simon for 15 days, with Peter, Cephas, for 15 days, and then he will go away. And then later on he will come back and meet with the other pillars of the faith. But let's get to the point that I want to highlight. And they began to, to relate. The word for relate here is the word exogeomai, which means they began to lead out. As they learned how Jesus led himself out of the scriptures, they start to exegete. And they relate their experiences on the road and how he was recognized by them in the breaking of the bread. And while they were telling these things, he himself stood in their midst. Now imagine now, the first time he's walking with them literally. The second time, as they are explaining something, the Lord appears in their midst. And how does he appear now? Not as a man. But he now appears to them in verse 37. They were startled and frightened and they thought that they were seeing a spirit. Now he appears to them as a spirit. I think this is what Paul says when he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 that I don't even know Christ after the flesh, but the Spirit. Let me tell you something. Your true encounter with God will only come when you know Him as a living Spirit. Now I'm going to call this dimension, knowing Christ after the Spirit, as the dimension called prayers. Prayers. That's how I would refer to it. You can go only so far as the Son of Man which is part of the dualistic nature of your, your composition, your constitutional makeup. You are son of man, you are son of God. And a son of man, you can go so far. And let me tell you, in our churches, if you have the candlestick, if you have the table, if you have the showbread, you may still function within the context of your flesh. But if you want to go beyond that dimension then you are now moving to not seeing Jesus just as a man, but you are now seeing Jesus as a spirit, and in that way, you are no more engaging him as a man, but you are now going to engage him as a spirit, and your spirit will engage his spirit. Okay? Your manhood, your humanity can, can engage his humanity as a man in that three-dimensional context of the outer court, but if you want to go beyond the veil, you have to now engage God on a completely different de level. And this dimension is where we're all wanting to journey to. And I really believe that when these, these two disciples, Cleopas and the other disciple, and I sometimes wonder who he was, when these two disciples started to lead Christ out on this dimension, then we are re beginning to see that something is going to happen on a different platform. Now look at this. Because I don't think God will fill the scriptures with all of these details if, if he didn't want to communicate something to us. Verse 38, And he said to them, Why are you troubled and why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me. See for the spirit does not have flesh. A spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I am. And he's trying to highlight to them that while he is a spirit, but he's more than a spirit. This is his glorified body. Okay, let's go on. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still could not believe it for joy and were marveling, he said to them, Have you anything yet to, to eat? You can see how Jesus loves eating. And what did they give him? They didn't give him bread now. They gave him a fish. 
You know, I want you to go and study how God separated the waters. The waters, so that He can take the earth out of the waters and take the heavens out of the waters. And while there are waters between the earth and the heavens, there's also waters above the heavens. You go and read Genesis chapter 1 again. And when we talk about fish in this dimension, we're talking about meat that comes from beyond the heavens. This is what, and I will refer to this if time permits me, when Aksa, the daughter of Caleb, got off her donkey. And it's amazing why donkeys are used. And I sometimes think, think that a donkey is a picture of an unclean animal. But when it is connected to the vine and its, and its colt is also connected to the vine, anything connected to, to the vine that produces revelation no matter how unclean it is, no matter how imperfect the structures and the organograms of our church is, but if it's plugged into Revelation, it can cause Jesus to ride into his Jerusalem and produce praises. And this woman gets off her donkey. She falls at the feet of her father after having motivated her husband to make the, uh, the request um, uh, for not just land possession, but for more than that. She gets up and she says, I want you to give me a blessing. And her father understood that. She did not want the physical earth. Because if you understand, her husband's name was Otniel. Otniel. And Otniel means a, 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 a young lion. A young lion. And, and he was one of the twelve judges of the nation of Israel in the book of Judges. One of the twelve judges. So he had physical jurisdiction as a judge represent at that point in time over the nation of Israel and over the promises of the Lord. But she came and she said, I want a blessing. And the father said to her, and this is the literal interpretation, I will not just give you the physical planet, the Eretz, the physical earth, the south country, the Negev. Two words are used in different translations. One is the physical location of your engagement and the other is, I will not just give you the physical planet, but I will also give you blessings that come from above. I'll give you waters that come from above. In other words, I will not only give you the planet, but I'll give you the heavens. I'll give you both. It can be yours. And it was pointing to a futuristic day. A futuristic day. And I really believe that we are now living in a time where in the Mal according to the order of Melchizedek, we are not just possessors of this planet. We are possessors of all things in Christ. It is, uh, it is given to us. It is in our custody. It is part of our inheritance. It's our legacy. It's, 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 it's our job description. We've been commissioned not to rule over the earth. In fact, the earth is too small for us too small. It is our job to rule over all things. We may be located on a physical piece of real estate called planet Earth. But our, but our, our order... See, the wind is even blowing when I speak. I mean, lightning follows you, wind blows over me. <laughs> It is our legal right to rule over the heavens and the earth. In fact, the earth is so small, it's like in our hands. Right now. Right in our hands. But let me get back to my point. And so, when we talk about eating fish, we're talking about eating something that's more than bread. There's a meat here that's coming to the body of Christ. And he took it and ate it before them. Now he said to them, these are my words. Okay? These are my words. Which I spoke to you while I was with you. That all things which are written about me in the law of the Pro Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. If you went to verse 27, you will say, see that he only expounded the law of Moses and the prophets. But now he is going to the Psalms also. This is the threefold dimension of a complete interpretation of the Scriptures. And for the first time, 
It's not only opening their eyes after having opened the scriptures, but he now opens their minds to understand the scriptures. Can I say something to you here? You will never, even if your eyes are open to see the Lord, you will never understand the scriptures until you move to this dimension of spiritual engagement. And all of this correlation takes place here. The pieces of the puzzle come together. It assembles itself, assimilates itself. And then you just get those little pieces coming together. And before you know it, you say, I see. For me personally, as I'm stumbling upon the teaching of the broken bread, which is the mystery of the body of Christ, I am now beginning to understand what the mystery of the body of Christ is. And as I would go and explore, explore through getting this little piece that came through another understanding of the breaking of the bread, I am absolutely positive that when you hear me again in the future, I would have discovered dimensions to, to the word Christ and the mystery of this Christ. That, uh, that previously I would have never seen because a little piece of, has been added to the puzzle. And now the picture is getting clearer. And it's all happening in the mind. For example, if I see the word Judah, it immediately causes a spiraling impact in me because I understand what the key to David is. To know David, you have to study his lineage, which is Judah. To understand Judah, you understand David. And before I know what, now I've got hours and hours of better teaching and better understanding in the subject of Judah. I mean, you've heard the expertise of people like Dr. Segi on, on the way he sees institutions. Or Sam, on the way uh, Dr. Sam would see the, the authority of God, jurisprudence, the rule. I mean, and, and before you know what, a whole world opens up because they found certain keys through which they open certain doors. And we look back and we say, wow, we never see it like that. How did we read all of these scriptures and never understand it? What happened was the apostles opened the door for you. The keys were given to them. To open the door and then hundreds of us, and not just us represented here, but all the congregations we, 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 we represent. Some of you are apostles of your own networks. So think about what an impact a school with 200 odd people may be having. Thousands will get to see this. A key has been given to you. And now your eyes are opened. That's correlation. That's assembling thinking in our mindsets. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and rise again from the dead the third day. And that repentance for forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed. In his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. You can see that? Go and forgive sins. It's there. But you can't do this in the flesh. You only can do this when you go into this dimension. You are witnesses of these things. Subjective witnesses. And behold, I am sending forth the promise. Now he says to you, in this dimension, of my Father upon you, but you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. So what's the first thing that will happen in this dimension after he opens your mind? Where your mind now goes beyond your flesh. You are now engaging the spiritual realm. You are going beyond the veil. What's the first thing that happens? You will see the scriptures more completely. If you only studied the law and the prophets, now you're going to study the law, the prophets, and the most intimate expressions of the law and the prophets, which is the Psalms. Where you bring these two dimensions, and it now becomes a subjective experience, and you no more sing a song to the Lord, you become the song. You no more praise the Lord, you are praised. You know, we we'll talk about your experience in the cave, but you now start to see that experience through a kind of a conjugal relationship with the Lord, so much so that you can say, the Lord is my rock and my fortress. The Lord is my shield. The Lord is my present help in times of trouble. Uh, um, as the deer pants after the waters, so my soul longs for you. Suddenly it's no more just nice statements. And sometimes filled with cliches. But now it is, it is personalized. 
These things only happen. I mean, for me, it's now become a lifestyle to feel this rest of the Lord. In the midst of great challenges around us. I mean, Segi has not even told you half the story of how we are being attacked. In this country and in the nations. And how that marauding element will go ahead of you to try and cause great consternation and, and misrepresentations. But in the midst of it, you don't want to defend yourself. As Sam would say, the truth will defend itself. You stand in the midst of your enemies and you act like you're loved by everybody. And in the midst of all of that, you have perfect peace, even though you know that you've got mountains to climb and and still valleys to go through and giants to face. But it doesn't matter. Rest and peace becomes a reality. It becomes a reality. And so... There's a few things that happens according to Luke's account. He leads them out so far as, uh, as Bethany and he lifts up his hands and blesses them. So let's see some of the things that happens. Apart from the correlation of the scriptures in your mind and having an exposition that now becomes a subjective witness to you. The first thing that happens is you wait to receive power on high. Come on high. And I want to say something. Some of you have been bathed in the presence of God. You've been washed at the altar um, uh, of washings in the school. If you have noticed some of the things that may have happened to you while you've been sitting under the washing of His Word, the laver, which was the place where you were being washed, some of the things that may have happened to you is you may have noticed a cleanness come upon you. You feel like you're even smelling better. You may have felt impurity and innocence, a refreshment. Have you noticed that? I mean, how many of you didn't even use a perfume because you felt so clean these days? The Aussies. I'll tell you, after today, the New Zealanders are going to need perfume. I heard the French are going to beat them today. That's what the Lord... <laughs> you can see how he is going to pray. He's not even here. <laughs> First thing that happens after all of this is that you wait on the Lord to be clothed in power. In this realm, when you ever get into this level, level of engagement... Nothing can be done without the endowment of power. I'm not talking about it in the Pentecostal paradigm. But you just get clothed upon. There are many baptisms. There's one baptism and many baptisms. And we get completely immersed. What we've been doing here, we've been baptized in the words. In the water of that which has been coming. We've been immersed and immersed and immersed and immersed. Second thing that happened is... He lifts up his hands and he blesses them. It is in this dimension that spiritual invocations are released. The the ministry of ordination, the sacrament of ordination takes place. It takes place in this dimension. Where you start to lay hands, impart blessings, release grace, activate things, initiate things in the spirit. It happens in this dimension. The third thing that happens is you start to return to the, to, to the centrality of, of your source. That is your Jerusalem. The epicenter of peace. Jeru over Salem. You come under the absolute government of God. He leads you back to your Jerusalem. And he does it with joy in your hearts. There's something about being connected to the source. And fourthly, the Bible says, verse 53, they will return to Jerusalem with great joy, 52. And 53, and while continuing in the temple, praising God, and were continually in the temple, what were they doing? Praising God. These are dimensions of prayer. These are expressions of prayer. These are, these, these are dimensions of how you prostrate yourself before God. But I really want to focus on Hebrews chapter 9. Let's get there quickly. I think it's very important that I highlight this point and then we, we can stop. 
got a few minutes. The dimension beyond the holies of holies. This is the place where the believer engages the God who sits on the throne. This is a dimension, the holies of holies for me, where you learn how to separate yourself from fleshly affections. I'm not talking about an ascetic kind of living that produces a false piety. But I'm talking about a a, a devotion in the spirit where you know that you're completely consecrated to God. Where chastise, uh, where, where consecration and sanctification, where the chaste and pure living takes place. Where you know you're pure without being fanatical. Without going through some strange behavioral habits. Where you can sit and watch sport and yet be totally devoted to the Lord. Without being contaminated. The fundamental of this dimension of the holies of holies calls for consecration devotion to the service of deity it involves sharing in God's purity and uh, and abstaining from earthly defilements you know I'm given to understand that uh, Sam touched on an area in in the culture of the South African church that um, that many of us will find ourselves very uncomfortable in. And that's the area of the consumption of wine. And this, this, this teaching, I mean this culture, was challenged a couple of years ago, well, at least ten years ago in South Africa. Uh, because in, in South Africa we have, uh, especially amongst the so-called non-white people, uh, the blacks, the Indians, the coloreds, uh, because of, of the social... Um, the negative social history that we've had, social historical history that we've had, most people who did not have a social life only found it in addiction to alcohol. And in that way, they found, it, uh, found a way to escape the reality of it. Of find, found a way to escape the reality of their present sufferings. And then came the apostolic message, firstly, from the Caribbean to us. The apostolic reformation. The restoration of Fifo ministry may have been in this country 30, 40 years. But the reformation message came um, through Dr. Robert Munyan and the conferences that he hosted and Noel Woodruff and so forth. And because they were, they, were, they were naive to the culture of South Africa, they immediately challenged this idea of abstinence from consumption of wine. And they definitely liberated minds to review and revisit the whole culture of wine consumption. And there were people within our country that decided to change their Pentecostal paradigm on the, uh, the area of abstinence from the consumption of wine and started to consume it. And started to consume it. And the sad part was, while they were liberated in their thinking, their levels of maturity were not ready for the consumption of the wine. And so, many tables, many apostolic tables, became contaminated and polluted with drunkenness. Now, I have a very simple philosophy. I am not interested in whether you have a glass or don't have a glass. My conscience has been emancipated in this area. Because you must remember, I come out of a background where I almost became an alcoholic. In fact, in some circles you could say I was addicted to alcohol, to a place where I, I, it's a miracle that I'm a preacher of the gospel today. I was not a savory sight when I consumed it. And God had to deliver me from it. God had to deliver me from that. But presently, For me personally, the argument is not whether you have a glass of wine or you don't have it. 
The argument is that if you put something in you, then let me see what comes out of you. If Christ does not come out of you, if folly, reckless living, carnality, frivolity, vain jesting, impurities, I've got a serious problem with you having what you have. If it becomes a medium of escaping your present sufferings and you've not learned how to rest in the covenant of God, then we have a problem. And so in some circles in the apostolic, people did not know how to engage this level. And instead of living a consecrated life, they lived a desecrated life. And so for me, at this point in time, spiritual maturity must be reflected beyond the veil. And our liberty, it is for freedom He has made us free. But when your freedom brings you into bondage, then your bondage should tell you that you are not ready for certain liberties. Are you understanding me? I'm using that as a simple example to communicate a simple truth. If anything you do, if it's eating to a place where you overeat, which is called gluttony, which is tantamount to drunkenness, because most Pentecostals will abstain from alcohol, but overeat and be so sluggish and lazy that they can't even pray. Then we have serious problems. When I talk about going beyond the veil, I'm talking about a devotion in such a way that whether you consume things or don't consume it, your life must be that of a eunuch completely dedicated to God. And that even in the secret places of our present journey, when you are hidden in some hotel far away in the world, you are living such a single life, that you can truly say, I don't live in the flesh anymore. But I'm living in the spirit, even though I'm embodied in this fleshly man. This is the dimension. When we move into this dimension, there's no prejudice. I mean, I only look Indian. I was Indian for a long time. Until I discovered I was not Indian. I was only born in a body that was just baked perfectly in an oven. And some of you were underbaked, of course. And some of you were overbaked. I am perfect. It's like the story of the three birds. I don't need a tan. I, I, get, I get confused when people say, we go to the beach to get a tan. Why do you need a tan? You heard the story of the three birds? It's too cold. It's too hot. I mean, the porridge I'm talking about. <laughs> but it's just right. That's me. <laughs> I discovered, and that defining moment didn't come 23 years ago when I came into the full-time ministry. That defining moment came less than 12 years ago when I discovered who I am in Christ. After studying theology, pursuing my f studies further, I never knew who I was. Sam never knew who I was. And that was my defining moment when I was not just born again, I was now born from above. And that born from above experience suddenly told me that I was disconnected from an earthly lineage called Naidu. And I was connected to a heavenly in, in, image after the order of Melchizedek. And now I am an, a part of an endless genealogy. I can say I am without mother and father. I got reconnected to the call and election of my faith. Now I don't live according to the context of my culture. But I live in accordance and obedience to the configuration of the grace that determines what I have to do as I walk as His exact representative in the earth. And so, although I'm housed in a body that looks perfect... 
I'm part of a different world. I'm an alien, stranger, a sojourner. This world can't appeal to me anymore. I'm connected to a completely different dimension. And it is that dimension that tells me about devotion, sanctification, consecration, clean, living, pure, and so forth. We have to bring the church to this level. I, 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 I'm saying this because I know what's going to happen. I know what's going to happen. Some of you, and I'm not going to even withdraw these words. Some of you will come into this school. You will talk the lingo, the language. You learned all the cliches. You'll even say that this message, I understand it. And you'll point the finger at everyone else that doesn't understand it. And you'll compare yourself with others. But you'll go out there and live worse than the ones you compared with. Not everyone that has heard this message from this school will live it. I guarantee you that. And maybe I'm the biggest skeptic on that point. But I hope through my sarcasm you'll be provoked to live the right life. I really hope it. And that we will not show and pollute our tables with that wanton, reckless, and sometimes drunken behavior that's governed by greed and use our freedom for as abuse and abuse the purposes of God. I pray to God that this school will produce a new bunch of virginity the earth has never seen. We'll be so chaste, so clean, that the world will be able to say they're untouchable as a people. That loves Jim. You know what's my greatest fear? Is the experience I had a couple of years ago. A couple, well, maybe over a year now. I can't remember time anymore. Age has caught up with me. But you know what's my greatest fear? Is the fear of God unclothing me of His presence. That's the greatest fear I have. And I had it once for three months. From the month of October to December. A couple of years ago. He removed his presence immediately after I came from one of those, as some would say, dizzy heights of success. Great conference. Nation opened up. Powerful accolades. Came home and got up that morning and God left me. For three months, there was no presence of God upon me. Just nice preaching. Which we all can do without the presence at times. Because we've learned the art and skill of proclamation. I'll never forget the month of December when his presence came back into my body and reclothed me. And I asked him why. And his answer was very simple. It was just to teach you a lesson. That without me you are nothing. And if you ever forget that, all your successes is because of me. And if you ever forget that, then I will kill you. And your death will be me disconnecting myself from you. That for me is more important now than praises, accolades, big conferences, calling yourself a father or apostle over people, whatever. That does mean it means nothing to God can take away my brand new car, my nice house, he can take away everything, but I cannot afford him to take away his presence. That's the dimension we have to get. Hear my heart here. I want to leave this as an apostolic instruction to all of you. That's why when you go beyond the veil, to this place of devotion, I'll close at one. You are now standing before God and you can never go before God without understanding a fundamental principle. The principle is, they say the high priest in the Old Testament, when he went before God, he brought a bowl of incense. In it were some of the most beautiful spices, frankincense, and so forth. And he would walk through the veil through the flesh, carrying this so that the altar of incense, the bowl of incense, the censer, would fumigate the immediate presence of the Lord in the area, the vicinity of the mercy seat, will perfume that presence 
And it's a symbolic way of saying that if you want to step beyond the veil, you, your smell determines your access or the reception of your entry into that dimension. Not your clever preaching. Not your clever singing. Not your ability to manipulate with words. You can't even convince God to get beyond the veil. The only way you step into that dimension, and that dimension is basically saying, God, I'm bringing myself as a living sacrifice to you, holy and acceptable, which is my only reasonable service. I have not conformed myself to the world, but I have allowed myself to come to you, having dedicated myself to your eternal will. God, as I stand in your presence, I'm offering myself as a living sacrifice. May the incense of my life perfume your presence. And will you now allow me to stand before the mercy seat and have access to your mercies? Let me say something. There's a lot of things we can lie with, with our appearances and so forth. But when you get to this dimension, beyond the, the, the flesh, the only way you can get there is by the purity of your spirit it comes as a living incense to him. It sounds so simple. A lot of things can lie, but your life can't lie. And your devotion in this area has to be simplicity and sincerity. That's what we say in the season. You don't practice what you preach. You preach what you practiced. Where your devotion is so singular that everything you are is not only seen to God, but it's visible to all men and women. That's the kind of devotion we're going to need in the season. Let me tell you something. To touch what we're going to do, what we're going to touch in this present season, and not be an Ananias and Sapphira, is only going to take place by this kind of living. Who enters the presence of God? He that has clean hands and a pure heart. What are the sacrifices of God? A contrite heart and a broken spirit. Do you think pride, boastfulness, uncleanness, and all of that stuff is going to stand in this dimension? It's total surrender to God. Then there's a second dimension to this. The mercy seat is not the throne of God. It's not the epicenter of government. I showed you this. I mentioned this from Psalm 99. If angels are above cherubim, are above the mercy seat, it means there's a place beyond that because God's throne is above angels. They stand before Him, they do not stand above Him. But when there's a mercy seat with angels above, it's telling you they are witnessing how God transacts with humans. Based on His grace and mercy. To know what the mercy seat is, you have to understand what's under the mercy seat. Under the mercy seat is the Ark of the Covenant. In, in my estimate, it is the medium through which you can travel into different dimensions in God. It's the, it's, it's the constituent of your further journeys as a living spirit in the economy and spheres of God. There are three things you have to understand here. Number one, and I don't have time to go into the detail of this, but I'll leave it with you, and, um, and you can further go and study it. Number one, there's a pot of manna. You know, Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone. In fact, I'm beginning to understand that everything that was in the outer court is now vested in the Ark of the Covenant. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of the mouth of God. In the natural, what God was saying is that even a rebellious people that journeyed for almost 40 years in the wilderness, was God faithfully fed them every single day. And the kind of manna, the, the word manna means what is this, became like a chewing gum in their mouth. 
It was enough for every day they could chew and meditate upon it and know that the word of the Lord will sustain them. It also reminds me that if rebellious people could be sustained with the food that came from heaven, then when I stand before the mercy seat, I must know that the source to my sustenance is the word of the Lord, and that if God was faithful with rebellious people, how much more He would be with obedient people. But when I stand before the mercy seat, I know that that thought reminds me that no matter what my journey is in life, I don't have to murmur, neither do I have to ask. But that thought of manner will only tell me to remember the goodness of the Lord as we heard. And it says, in the goodness of the Lord, all my needs are met. I've now come to the place of believing that at the mercy of God, you don't have to ask. You just stand and remember His goodness. We must go to a place in this present season as a people, an apostolic people, who will not come to ask for material things, but will stand and behold the goodness of God and remember that every day He gives us His food to eat. The second thing that happens in the mercy seat is Aaron's rod. Aaron's rod. Why will God put Aaron's rod in the mercy seat? I mean, I thought about it. Why a rod in the mercy seat? Listen, most people say the, the, the Ark of the Covenant is the presence of the Lord or the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And if you follow the presence of the Lord, then He will lead you. Some people think it's a wind. Others think it's a feeling. But let me tell you, the presence of God, if you want that Ark to lead you, you have to remember the pot of manna. You have to remember Aaron's rod. And in, in, in Numbers chapter 17, the story said that there were 12 leaders to the tribe of Israel, each leader over his own tribe, to the tribes of Israel. Each leader. And each leader of each tribe was called a father over, over his tribal unit. But because there was a, a continuous clamoring for positions and a lack of submission to divine authority, God had to settle this matter once and for all. God had to establish who the leader is over the tribes, the nation of Israel, even though there were 12 leaders, 12 gates, 12 tribes. The word rod in this context is a reference to an Old Testament word, mater, M-A-T-T-E-H. Do you know what the word mater means? The word mater for rod means a rod. A, a tribe. A tribe. So when God says tribe or rod, it's the same imagery. It also means a scepter or a crook or a staff or a spear in the hand of God. The word mater is, is, has so many multiple meanings to it. So when God speaks about 12 tribes, He's talking about 12 sticks in His hand, determined by the configuration and design of the anointing He has implanted through the prophetic word upon them. And no two tribes had the same prophetic destiny. God's like a golfer, I often say. 12 sticks in His bag. The placement of the ball determines the choice of the stick. What's the point? that I want to highlight very simply the rod of Aaron the word rod means a symbol of authority of leadership of spiritual direction of guidance have you heard that portion of scripture thy rod and thy staff they comfort me you, what you thought a rod a stick from heaven do you know who comforts you in your troubles is the one that is your symbol of leadership and direction. The corporeal principle of God is that God raises a leader to lead you, to stand with you, to take you through your wilderness. He's called the shepherd of your soul. So God settles this matter. He says to Moses, rebellion is in the place, there's an undermining of leadership, and each leader sees himself as the leader. 
Go read Numbers chapter 17. So God says, this is how I settle the matter. Bring 12 sticks. Each leader that has a symbolic stick in his hand. The rod. Bring it. Write his name on it. And make sure, read Numbers chapter 17. It says, write the name of the father of each stick. Lay it before me in the, in the tabernacle of meeting. And later on he says, it becomes the tabernacle of witness. Put it before me. And the rod that blossoms, that rod is the rod I've chosen. Can I say something here? Some of you want the presence. Some of you want to chase this word. Some of you want to do your own thing. Um, in terms of taking this apostolic message, if you don't know how to submit to the rod of authority, then you are going to be lawless in a lawful society. Understand this. This is very important. I've never emphasized leadership like I am now. In fact, I think I fell into the trap of democracy for too long. I'm serious about this. So the twelve sticks were there, and then suddenly Aaron's rod blossomed. And it blossomed with almond blossoms and produced ripened almonds on a rod. When that rod blossomed, God said, that's the rod I chose over the twelve tribes. And that's the symbol of my authority and leadership for that season in the journey. Now to stop this rebellion, that rod will become a perpetual reminder that there may be twelve co-equal tribes that constitute the house of God, but I determine whose rod blossoms, and if that rod blossoms, then that is my symbol of leadership for that season. If you don't submit to it, you are lawless. I love the almond, the, the imagery of the almond, because the almond blossoms in winter. And all the trees in Israel is absolutely naked, barren, where they, every tree is surviving, every tree, not just the almond tree, is surviving to live. Suddenly one day, in the heart of the winter, the midnight of one's life, like when, when, era, when, when Jacob came to Luz, L-U-Z, came to Luz, which he renamed Bethel. It was at the midnight of his life, when he could not travel anymore. And Luz means the place of the almond. The place of the almond. In the midnight of your life, in the winter of your life, when everything is surviving and holding on, waiting for resurrection life, when there's no evidence of summer appearing, a rod blossoms in the midst of it. And that tells you that summer is coming. The summer, the winter is over, the summer is on the horizon. Aaron's rod is telling you that God causes the symbol of his leadership and authority to blossom in a season of absolute impossibility where natural circumstances do, do not mitigate towards the blossoming of that rod, God causes it to blossom. And what does God say when that rod blossoms? In the midst of all of the other rods, He says, that's the leader I chose. I want to say to you, you know where your submission lies? In identifying whose rod is blossoming in the winter of the church season at this point. And then, if you want to know about how to follow the ark, understand the, cons the compo composition of what is in the ark. Not just the pot of manna, but that rod. And if you can't submit to leadership, you will never go to this dimension. The third thing in the ark of the covenant was the testament. And you got the explanation from Sam. That is God's hand. He wrote it with his finger. Sealing and signing the guarantee that we are heirs of the Father and joint heirs with the Son. Legal custodians to everything the Father has. And it is given to us to administrate it on his behalf. That is a guarantee that shakes my mind. And it was sealed with the blood of Jesus. And the down payment of that, according to Ephesians, is He gave us one third of the Godhead to tell us 
how serious he is about this. And that one third, the Holy Spirit, is there to execute the last will and testament of Jesus through us. Do you know what that means? Everything, all things have been given to us. That's called the mercy seat. The Ark of the Covenant carries you now based on the, those, those three components to the dimension called above angels to the Daba, the cherubim. I don't have time to go into that. But beyond the angels is a place over the mercy seat called the Daba, D-E-B-I-R, from which the Daba, these are Hebrew words, D-A-B-A-R, the voice of God speaks, trumpets. Now we as a church, we don't want to stand at the mercy seat and just muse on goodness, on spiritual authority, and on the eternal covenant that God has entered with us by swearing to Himself. We want to go to the dimension where we would come to back to the place where we would be above angels. For a little while we were below them. We want to come to the place like Aksa that will get off a donkey, fall on the feet uh, on the ground before the feet of her father and say, I don't want the physical planet only. Give me more than the planet. I want now to decode the unsearchable riches of Christ. I want to know the mysteries of the kingdom. I want to give explanation to principalities and powers uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and kingdoms uh, so that they will, through me, understand the mystery called God, the Godhead. Do you know angels need to make notes from our sermons to get to understand the Lord? Yes. Yes. The highest form of angel shut his eyes because he cannot stand the presence of the Lord. Cannot look into the face of God. The highest form of angel can study Isaiah. And when it does sing, it sings the whole earth is filled with the glory of God. If the angels see the glory on us, they then can sing about the holiness of God. If we fall short of that glory, then the heavens is bankrupt for the season, waiting for the suns to arrive, to emerge, that will give explanation to the mysteries of God. So when we leave here, don't look at the school as the end, the ceiling. It's only setting up the stage for you to go and get connected. Get connected to your source. Get connected to your inheritance. Identify whose rod is blossoming. And I'm speaking to leaders now of churches here. Local members, you have no choice. You can't sit in one church and say, Oh, well, I'm going to choose Segi or Sam. Or Sean or, 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 or Franz. If you are under a pastor, you have to submit to that rod. If you don't, you are rebellious and practicing witchcraft. You're a sorcerer. And local pastors should identify those candlesticks that brings illumination to them. Those rods that blossom and go and submit to that. And in that you'll get the Ark of the Covenant. And the leadership of God taking you beyond the mercy seat to His throne. Amen? Amen? If we do this, we leave the school directed and guided. My time is up and I've abused it. Please stand. That's the dimension called praise. Coming to a place of absolute surrender and prostrateness before the living God. Lift your hands to God. I pray to God lawlessness will not be in this house. That these schools will not...